Welcome back to the fourth episode of Vetna's <laughs> Confessions. Uh, today I have actually a couple of really solid topics that I wanted to go over. I've he- received heaps of messages in the last two weeks. Um, and I did like a poll on Vetna School just seeing like what is the number one kind of thing that you know, people would love more assistance with in clinic. And a lot of them were help with anesthetic, like anesthetic monitoring, radiology positioning, which I think is valid. Mm -hmm. That is very valid because it's hard. Um, And the other one was, what was it? Medication, help with medications. So medications, my pharmacology guide on veterinary school is probably the best guide that I have ever made. I like I spent so much time doing it because I just, each time I do another page, I'd be like, oh my gosh, I should add this in there. And it just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It's huge. And it's so full of just like the most important information that you will need as a vet nurse. So if you use code, and this is just for my podcast girls, if you use the code podgirl, you will get 40% off vet nurse school so anything across vet nurse school so if you are struggling with medication do yourself a favor and get the pharmacology guide just just trust me like there's stuff in there that you know you won't read in a textbook like certain breeds that are prone to react to certain medications just like little things you know um that is so relevant to vet nurses but that you might not learn in TAFE or at um school kind of thing um In regards to radiology positioning, so x-ray positioning, even kind of taking x-rays, I am working on that for you. I'm going to make a radiology positioning guide and it's a lot of work so I have to have all the illustrations done. So it's going to be, you know, a visual, it's not all textbooky, it's visual like images of the dogs and how you should position them. So you can kind of blow it up into a poster, stick it on the wall in your x-ray room and you are laughing. And of course it will be in the token vet nurse school pink so it's nice um and i'm going to talk to you right now about anesthetics and how to become more confident whilst doing your anesthetics and just a couple of kind of tips and advice that i have for you and then i wanted to talk a little bit later on about my kind of experience as a practice manager and because i get this message a lot um about people kind of moving from like a general vet nurse role into either a management position or a head kind of vet nurse position and it's daunting and you know you can do as many kind of courses as you want but it's just a couple of things that I think that I you know I couldn't have learned unless I'd done them so I'm going to tell you guys about those what I would do differently and what I thought think works and things that helped me along the way so to start off anesthetics so a big one that I kind of saw like when we'd be training vet nurses like young young girls is that we kind of get into the habit of just hoping you kind of hold your breath throughout the whole anesthetic and just kind of hope it all goes swell and I can can totally relate to that Um, but there's a kind of a couple of things that kind of can kind of release you from feeling that anxiety that when that you have when you walk into the anesthetic room uh first one is kind of just being open and talking to your surgeon so the vet that you are working with having like a good relationship with that surgeon just being able to speak to them you know on you know a personal kind of level it kind of breaks down that whole oh it's the vet surgeon they're you know something else and I'm just the nurse kind of thing just work on that work on that relationship and trying to kind of find some common ground chit chat away with that vet before you're going into that surgery and it kind of builds a bit of a relationship but so that when you are in that anesthetic and say you know something doesn't look right on your monitoring equipment or you know uh, you know physically like vital signs and stuff like that you're picking up and it's not kind of all like correlating you can just simply say to that vet because that vet is trained you know to be able to you know monitor an anesthetic as well but their sole priority in that instance is you know 
spaying that dog or castrating that dog or you know getting into that abdomen and getting out as fast as possible kind of thing they don't want to be in that surgery room surgery room as much as you don't want to be in that surgery room it goes back to like finding a good surgeon like especially like an orthopedic surgeon that is calm and relaxed and doesn't kind of get stressed is such a blessing like when you when you find them you're like oh my god like i love doing surgery with this vet but some of them I do totally understand where they're coming from, but I but I do understand where the nurses come from, that it's not kind of pleasant when they're so highly strung as well. So just kind of building on that relationship and then being able to go into the surgery room, you're monitoring and you can just casually say like, hey, like I'm, the SPO2 has kind of dropped a little bit. Um, I'm going to do X, Y, Z to kind of fix it. So, you know, for example, so say SPO2's, drop it dropped a little bit heart rate dropped a little bit it's, you know something's not right maybe you would lower the iso you would maybe kind of put a wet swab on the tongue reposition your spo2 make sure that that is a correct reading also in saying that checking with the stethoscope manually checking with the stethoscope checking mucous membrane what's our capillary refill time are we still nice and pink is there any kind of paleness there say so if the patient um so if the heart rate is elevated a little bit and then you notice the gums are a little bit pale, it's like, what do you think that would entail? That would entail to me is that that patient is maybe in a little bit of pain. If their respiratory rate is up as well, they're breathing up, they've got a bit of pain. Often pain will kind of correlate with the gums kind of going a little bit pale as well. It also correlates with blood loss. So if you're in a big fat dog spay, and there's a lot of blood coming out, you know, that the gums might also go a little bit pale and you might kind of just want to be closely, closely, closely monitoring that. Um, what else? So, yeah, when that happens and, you know, something just doesn't, you know, you notice something, say, you know, everything else, like a bunch of the vital signs are looking good, but then there's one that's just like a little bit off and you're just like, oh, I'm not really sure. Is it even worth mentioning just mention it just mention it just say hey and don't say uh this is happening what do i do you just say hey like i've just noticed like the heart rate is has dropped a little bit um respiratory rate is still kind of it's kind of the same um we've got no you know draw so when you're pinching between the toes and like blink reflex so if you're pinching between the toes and the patient is kind of retracting that means that they are not deep enough they're kind of not not waking up but they could possibly be waking up so we want to adjust our anesthetic so you would elevate your isoflurane just a smidge keep it going for a little bit if recheck that pinch if there's no drawback then maybe you can lower it down a bit the the key with isoflurane is that we want to get them onto that perfect anesthetic plane that they can be on the lowest amount of isoflurane or sevaflurane, whatever your clinic uses, they can be on the lowest amount, but it maintains their anesthetic plane where their eyes. So you learn this as well in your nursing that their eyes will, um, during, <laughs> I'm going to go off. I'm so off track here, but so say if you're looking at their eyes, so you're checking their, um, their pull reflex. If that's not kind of moving at all, you're going to want to check where their eyeball is situated so where their eye is facing so when your patient is anesthetized your patient's eyes will kind of roll back and forth kind of thing so when your patient is anesthetized they will roll down and then once your patient is onto a perfect anesthetic plane they will roll back to the normal kind of forward like straight forward so that is a really really good indicator um, lots of people don't kind of know about that and or don't kind of um, use it as an indicator of having that anesthetic plane but it is really good really good indicator for that um also just tapping not tapping on their eye which i have seen done before tapping in there like um in the corner of their eye just tapping to just check that there is no reflex there where they are blinking um that would mean that they are nicely anesthetized uh what else if your patient is over anesthetized so they're too deep so that would look like the heart rate is getting low, respiratory rate is low, um, or maybe they're not taking a breath at all. It's because they are too sleepy. 
So then in that case, we want to decrease our isoflurane. It's too high. I, a guy at work today asked me what is like the normal level for isoflurane, like patients to be on isoflurane during an anesthetic. I was like, well, it's a tricky one because lots of people are treated, treated, they're taught so many different ways, you know. I would always try and have my patient on the lowest level possible. Like I've had a patient on anesthetic, um, you know, and they've been on 0.9%, you know, throughout an anesthetic because they just didn't, you know, they were dopey. Maybe the pre-med hit them um, and they just didn't need to be on, you know, anything over one. Um, I think around one and a half is ideal. Just it, it is case by case, but kind of lowering, my goal was always to kind of get a patient down to the, the lowest that they could go and that therefore they recover a lot quicker as well. So once your patient is, the surgery is done, you turn off that ISO and they're kind of up and ready to go, like not ready to go, but they're getting extubated within the next kind of five to 10 minutes. The worst thing is a long, long recovery. You've had that patient say, on a higher isoflurane throughout a whole procedure and hello Daphne um and then when you to so you've got say you've got them for some reason you've got them up on four and then you turn it off and then they are still so zonked for so long and that's not that's not what you want at all um I've worked with vets before that would say you know just chuck them up on five for a minute if they were kind of reacting which and then I've had nurses come in and be like oh my god that is so scared like I've never been told to and I'm like yeah it's just how people are taught so different you know they're different places different clinics different nurses um different schools but I think that it's probably a little bit outdated to kind of chuck them up on a high level if it's um not really extremely warranted so yeah keeping them as low as you can throughout the anesthetic so say um, if, yes, your patient is a little bit pale, anything that doesn't seem right, it just seems a little bit off, just mention it to your surgeon. So say, I would say, hey, the um, blood pressure, for example, blood pressure is always kind of an issue throughout anesthetics. It's a nightmare. But once you kind of have done it a couple of times, I'll give you one trick with blood pressure. If you're using a blood pressure monitoring, like a cuff, my favorite, favorite place to put a blood pressure cuff is on the tail base because it is a nice, like consistent thickness. It's out of the way of, you know, they've got their legs up and, you know, tied and tied to the table and out of, the, you know, it's just kind of messy. They get knocked, they get knocked with ECG cords. Um, it just is awkward. And it's, if it's, ele if the leg is elevated as well, it's not like the level with the heart, but the tail is always been a winner for me. So tail base, and because it's least, if the if a patient is on their back, it's like the least thing that's going to move around. Also, always make sure that you run three, you run your blood pressure three times. So you go, you know, you go calculate on your monitor, let it run through once, and it'll give you a reading. Okay, let it run through again, give you a reading, let it run through again. And I would take the third one as the accurate one. That's just for when you're getting the monitor up and like at the start of the anesthetic. So then from then on, you would trust that measurement throughout. So you should be measuring it probably every five minutes throughout that anesthetic. Um, but do it three times at the start of your anesthetic before you believe it kind of thing. Make sure that you've adjusted it as well. So if you've got a small or a large dog, make sure that that is um, adjusted on your monitor because I would find like that was uh, a lot of, you know, the nurses would be like, hey, it's not working. I'm like, you, you've you forgotten to adjust it between um, and it does make a huge difference. So just check that as well. Uh, if it's still not working, unplug it from the machine and plug it back in. That does help. Um, your cuffs might have a hole in them throw out your old cuffs, get some new ones. Uh, and so say your blood pressure is low and you would say, so what would, first thing po most people would do if the blood pressure is low, it's like, okay, so the blood pressure is low, the patient's kind of subdued. That's usually from the pre-med that that blood pressure will kind of be lower, which is fine. So if we were concerned about how low it was, number one thing people would do is, you know, check ISO, it's not too high, that we're not anesthetizing the patient too much, that their whole body is going too asleep um and then you would increase your 
intravenous fluids to get that blood pressure pumping around again. And you would say to the vet in this instance, hey, um, blood pressure's a little bit low. I was just going to give a 10 mil per kilo bolus. Um, is that all, you know, you're happy with that? And they'll usually be like, yep, great, go ahead, you know. And then you give the bolus, redo it again, um, redo your blood pressure, and then see where it's at. And then just say to them, yep, that blood pressure's come up nice. Um, and then go from there kind of thing. If your patient's a little pale, pale, I would say to the vet, hey, like, um, all vitals are, if the vitals are all good, yeah, all vitals are good, just letting you know the patient is a little bit pale. Um, so I'm just going to keep an eye on that. It's about, and I read an article, the most breakdown that there is in a clinic is communication. It's communication. Just, we've got to keep talking to each other. We've got to communicate everything that's going on you know if the patient is and like a lot of this time like pre-meds and things will affect your anesthetic so say if you've given a pre-med and you notice the patient is super sleepy tell the vet you know say to them hey look that patient the patient i've just pre-medded um that yorkie in cage number three super sedate after that pre-med so um and then you can note it as well. And then when that vet goes to anesthetize that patient, because they might just come out of a consult and be like, okay, let's get into surgery, let's go. Not really, you know, they're just rushing, whatnot. But just make sure that everything you've noticed within the clinic, you're telling the vets because they can't be everywhere at once. And they've got a lot on their plate, you know, going back and forth through consults and then to surgery, they've got a lot to think about. So the best thing we can do is just take them the vital information that we can and just kind of serve it to them, be like, hey, this is what's happening. This is what we're thinking we should do. What do you reckon? What what would you what would you prefer we do? Just kind of giving them the the most important things, keeping the patients in mind. You know, the best thing to kind of um caring for the patients as such. So that's some anesthetic tips. Um also anesthetic wise, I always found this is something that I noticed a lot of my nurses didn't really care for this. But even for me, even, you know, 10 years of doing it, I had to do this. So say you've got your, you're doing an anesthetic and say your end tidal CO2 is, um, it's quite elevated or something like that. I could still to this day could not wrap my head around with any other kind of parameter in an anesthetic i would be like oh okay cool i just need to do this to counteract that but when it came to end tidal co2 so capnography i could not for the life of me remember what i needed to do to counteract it i'm not sure why i think it's because the thing with capnography capnography it came into the game quite late so when I was studying it wasn't really pushed I know that there was one page in my course about it but most of the anesthetic monitors back then did not have end tidal CO2 like all we were using like 10 years ago was a pulse ox that's all we were doing you know and then came in your ECG blood pressure so it's all kind of evolved but capnography was definitely the last one so I don't know if I just didn't grasp it when I was learning it so in that case, when, you, when you've when you got a, a parameter with your anesthetics that you just don't know how what you should do in that instance, I had this book and it was like a purple like folder and I had in there um, all the most important things that I learnt in my study, just like random pages that just I could just always need to refer to. And I had in there about four sheets of paper in regards to anesthetics and what to do if this occurred in this anesthetic. And there was one in there for um, entitled CO2. Um, and it would say, if entitled CO2 is increased, do this. And it was just this couple of sentences with what to do. And if it's low, do this. And the amount of times that I referred to that book and I kept it in the surgery room, um, was ridiculous and I, I just couldn't but if that is something that you need and you get into an anesthetic and you're just still not you just haven't grasped it yet make a book like that make sit down with your like your study books or like you know do some research it's all in my anesthetic guide I put all of that information that I had struggled with I actually put it in that anesthetic guide because I was like this is really important 
Um, so that's on veterinary school if you want it. But if you've got like, you know, like the theory for it, just write it down and just have a singular kind of book or kind of pocket guide of what to do in that those instances. Even if you just hand write it out. And then when you go into surgery and you, you don't have time to kind of think, just have that ready for you, like ready with you. Just keep it in your pocket. Keep it in a folder, like keep it in the surgery room. It's totally fine. Just laminate it. Keep it as sterile as possible. Um, oh, if you want, download my anesthetic guide and just you, you can crop those all into um, kind of pocket size. Um, what are they called? pocket guides kind of thing and then just keep them all together and then you are laughing honestly it, it was a lifesaver for me I, and that's why I made that guide because I know I just know that there has to be people that are, are the same um there's other stuff as well that I could just never rack my brain around like a couple of oh it's um a medication I had to make this massive poster and put it on the wall for myself and it was for um like butorphanol so you know the one that's it's butorphanol it's torb it's torbogesic it's got like 17 names for it and i was always like oh my god why cannot we just name it by the brand like the active ingredient every single vet that would come through would call it a different name and i just used to find it so frustrating so i made this big guide and i put stuck it on the wall um and it honestly helped everyone, but it was like people, I was like, if this makes us our lives easier, let's just do it. And that's, that's a big point of why I started Venno School. Cause I was like, why are we making it so hard for ourselves? And we're making it like, we shouldn't need textbooks or, you know, guides to help us. I'm like, why? Like make it easy, make our lives easy. Um, moving on. I wanted to talk about a couple of the things that I learnt whilst being a practice manager and things that I would do differently and pieces of advice that I would give to someone that's just moving into that kind of a role. And that that is one of the big ones. It was making um, the nurses' lives easier by creating this stuff that they struggled with, even if it was, you know, a little bit silly, you know, putting those guides up, doing that kind of thing to make, the, and I would, you know, we would have kind of, um, what are they called? Like not performance reviews, but like just chats. I'd be like to someone, if I felt like they were sad, Hey, do you want to have a chat? Like let's chat. And I'll just say like, what's, what's going on? Like, what can I do to help you? Um, what, you know, what do you want to do more of in the surgery? Like, what do you want to do less of? Like, how are you trekking along? And it was really good. Like I had, some of the nurses say, you know, like, oh, it feels really good to kind of just chat and just kind of get it off. And I would never, I, big thing for me is I am not a formal kind of person. Even when like we would interview people, I'm very like kind of, let's just chat, you know, let's, because I just feel like you get to know people a lot better and they kind of bring down their walls as well. And they feel comfortable, like they feel comfortable in the clinic to kind of be themselves and therefore that you kind of see their best um their best sides and their best work as well if they feel comfortable and they feel passionate about the job that's a huge one is when your nurses feel passionate about being in the clinic coming to work they will be your best workers they will be your best kind of allies to have one thing that i did struggle with as a manager was that i kind of was held back from what i think from what how I would do it now kind of thing. And that was from management above me, which is going to be hard. Like if you're in a corporate, that is definitely hard because if you have like um, territory managers coming in and things like that and like workshops and things, you've kind of might be given structure for those kind of things. But there's definitely stuff that I think that I should have done that I would do differently next time. Um, I struggle with the fact that, and I was told this as well, <laughs> I was too worried about, I want these girls to be my friends. Like I wanted to be friends with these girls more than their boss. And I'm not a conflicty type of person. And that's what I was kind of being taught that I needed to be harsher. And it just, even when I would be harsher, it just wasn't right. And I always felt like crap. Like I felt awful, you know, it made me feel terrible. And 
guess what? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, what else? I read a really, really, really good book and I would push, I would literally push everyone to read this book, but especially if you're managing people, um, because managing people, it, you know, it doesn't, any aspect of working in a vet clinic, it's the managing of people and managing of staff that is the hardest thing. And like, I kind of went into the management role just kind of being like, I love doing the paperwork and I love doing marketing and social media and all that kind of stuff. And then it was like, my whole role was mostly just managing the staff. And I was like, oh my goodness, like, oh my goodness, this is so not what I thought it was. Um, but it can, and then in the same token, it can be like the best part of it as well. Oh yeah, so this book that I read was how to win win friends and influence people. How to, how to win, win friends and influence people. Um, it's a Dale Carnegie book and it is, and I've read more of his books since reading it. I read this book twice. You should have seen the copy that I had. It was so tattered. Like I took it overseas. I read it again. I gave it to someone. I was like, you need to read this book. Like it is, honestly, it was the best thing. And I use it even in my personal life, you know, talking to people, just reading people, getting, you know, it is so good. And it's not about winning friends, like buying friends kind of thing. It's about being a people person it's about how to win you know winning at being a people person it's amazing and i would recommend it to you definitely read that um what else would i do if i was going to do management again i would definitely chat more with the staff um and kind of highlight and i i feel like we definitely did um highlight on their kind of passions and i always felt that the girls worked so well when they were kind of really given the jobs that they love and they were amped for them you know and and recognize when people get recognition they kind of it's even like you know when um say you make a mistake or something and you're told off about it and you feel like crap like and, and you feel crap anyway if you've made a mistake but then if someone else says it as well it just makes it worse and they think that because they're getting told off that they'll be better from then on it's actually the total opposite what i found and what we should be doing is when people do stuff right call them out you know call it out in a work meeting did you see did you guys see what you know, Sharon did this week, absolutely amazing, you know, boost them up, hype them up, even if it's something by you, hype them up, you know, um, and they literally just kind of go from doing really well to literally excelling, every time someone is given a positive comment or a positive kind of, hey, like, and I would say like to these, these girls would be so good with clients, and I'd be like, that was so good, like, the, the clients love you, and you can see them go, fuck yeah, I am. I'm really good with clients. And they just kind of blossom and just kind of get better and better and better at their job instead of just look, you know, looking down at people and just kind of slamming people down. You did this wrong, you did this wrong, you did this wrong, you did this wrong. That is that is the best and probably most efficient way to push people out of your clinic, push people out of the industry because – who wants that? Everyone is trying their hardest and it's a hard industry. It's so hard. And I just think that you I, going into a management role, focus on the positives. Also, which word for me and I, not everyone, I don't think is like, I am someone who would find the easiest way to do any job. The, the easiest and quickest way to do any kind of job, which always kind of worked for me and just made the, made sure that we were really efficient kind of thing. Um, another one, a girl could put in a message like how should how does she um, make sure everyone's getting all the job roles done, like um, tasks within, within a clinic and to make sure that people aren't kind of carrying the weight of others, which I think is really important. And that does happen. That does happen quite a lot. I would make up lists of your set roles in the clinic. So say you've got 
you've got people on reception. So you've got reception, you've got maybe like a surgery nurse, maybe you've got like a hospital nurse, um, maybe you've got a, a consult nurse, someone doing like anal glands and things, um, and you might have like a medicine nurse or, you know, somebody around there. And you'll have maybe like a kennel hand. Sit down and go through and make lists of every job that everyone is responsible for in a day. Just make a list, put them up on the wall so those people can then throughout that day just check, okay, I'm on surgery today. This is my list of jobs, my my role for that day. I've got to do all of this. And you it won't take long when all of those jobs will just come second nature to them when they're in that role. You know, if you've got like a rotating roster. Just set out what needs to be done and then because people I also found you've got to make these types of things easy for people. You know, if they've got a you know, they're thinking about their patients, they're at anesthetized, they don't need to kind of then be like, Okay, once I go out of here, what am I gonna do? Look, what can I do? Don't even let them have to think about it. Just make a list and they can go, Oh, okay, that's what I gotta do. Just simplifying everything. You know, we don't have to overcomplicate a lot of stuff. So that is always a really good idea. Just if people are, so say if you're setting up that structure with your um, kind of allocated nurse roles, that's probably the best thing to do. Just kind of outline everything that you need done within that day. I think that that kind of covers it. I'm probably going to do a little, a few more posts on social media in regards to um, tips for managers and like boosting up your staff and things like that uh, and if there's anything else that you want to see from me please let me know yes if you use code podgirl on vet nurse school you will get your discount and please let me know what you want to hear of next in the next podcast i will speak to you guys soon